Into the wild I'll go and into the wild I am It's been a while, freedom child Since I left my roots back home Into the wild I'll go Into the wild I am It's been a while, freedom child Since I left my roots back home Welcome to the Free Birth Society podcast. This is a radical space for women who are ready to celebrate their autonomous choices in birth, motherhood, and beyond. Together, we'll learn about wild birth through personal narrative, we'll explore the politics of birth, and we'll analyze everything that relates to our lives as women from a feminist perspective. Here's your host, Emily Saldea. It's been a wild freedom Like most of my listeners, you are devouring these episodes, fascinated by the women's stories, and wondering if you could do this too. Do you wish that you had a step by step strategy for how to actually plan and manifest your free birth? Our complete guide to free birth is the number one course for free birth, and we made it for women just like you. It's a self guided online intensive course that will teach you everything we think you need to know about how to birth freely and in your power. We'll take you all the way from unpacking industrial care to what DIY prenatal care looks like, how to pick and prep your support team, what to expect, look out for, and how to shift when more support could be needed. Yes, we'll cover the what ifs, how to prevent complications, and how to orient your entire life towards a powerful birth. So head on over to freebirthsocietycourses.com now and take the first step towards the birth of your dreams. Today on the show, we have Chantel telling us her stories of three full-term pregnancies and three pregnancy losses in five different countries. Chantel speaks to how she navigated foreign cultures and governmental systems as an expat and shares her journey from a medicalized, torturous birth to a birth center birth and then a simply wild free birth at home. We also discuss the disruption of her postpartum time by having to immediately interface with the system to obtain a birth record. Chantel's story is a lighthouse for the pregnant women feeling hopeless and who know that there must be another way. Free birth happens anywhere and everywhere, even in countries where most people believe home birth is illegal. Welcome, Chantel. Thank you. Excited to have you here, excited to hear your story. And yeah, I mean, really, we could just start from the beginning. Was this your, your free birth? Was that your, what number baby was that? Third. Third. Okay. So I would love to hear about your first two and anywhere you really want to start from, you know, this journey of, of becoming mother and how these birth experiences and your postpartums shape you into, you know, choosing a pretty radical choice. Um, yeah, I'm so excited. So just go ahead and kick us off wherever you want to start. Yeah, so my first pregnancy, I had just arrived in Algeria. I was joining my husband, who is also American, but teaches English. And so he got a teaching position and they couldn't process both of our visas at the same time. So I had to lag behind. So I was in the US and they told us three to six weeks. It was three months. Of and course. then when I finally joined him in Algeria, it was just a couple of months of trying to acclimate to a new culture, new cuisine, and I was struggling with this indigestion, and I didn't know what was going on, and I'm like, ah, maybe too many French fries, too much French bread, I don't know what's going on, this bloating is not going away, and then of course I'm You're pregnant. <laughs> And I, you know, I was so accustomed to regularly skipping periods here and there. So oh. I didn't really, since puberty, I've always had like the regular periods. So I went to the doctor about this indigestion and they're like, when's your last, when was your last period? And I'm like, oh, don't worry about that. That's typical for me to skip a month here and there. Mm-hmm. And of course I was between eight and 10 weeks. Okay. And just oh thinking I was bloated. <laughs> we were already married for five years and that was the first time we 
you know, first conception, first pregnancy. And, and was the news welcomed? Like, were you yeah. happy? Okay. Yeah. Surprised because I thought like, oh, I'm going to do all these things to prepare for my conception and I'm going to be in this perfect state of health and all of that. And I'm just there binging on French fries and, <laughs> and French bread trying to get accustomed and acclimated and you know just coping with being in a whole nother country and a whole nother space so yeah the news was definitely welcomed and that pregnancy was just pretty effortless um you know I, I did my prenatal care there in Algeria I didn't really know very much other than whatever the, the standard typical you know you get an ultrasound you do this you do that and you just kind of follow along so we had already been living overseas for about a year so I think for our families in particular it was like oh you're pregnant so you must be coming home and it's like well not necessarily but um we had already kind of forged such a bond like we are our family you know our our little family of two is a family and so I felt like I had everything I needed in him and with him so I didn't feel weird being far away um, but getting closer to birthing we left Algeria and he got a new contract in another country and as I was preparing to travel and we went to the U.S. we visited our family we had the baby showers and all the news and the fanfare and as I was googling birth in this new country I was like why don't I see anything about home birth um, even though I don't know anyone in my family who home birth, my friends have, I know friends who have given birth at home. So I knew I wanted to birth at home and I just couldn't find anything about, is it okay? Can I birth at home? And I actually saw the contrary. I didn't even think that some countries would consider it illegal to give birth at home. I, I just couldn't make sense of it. So when I used to think about giving birth in a hospital, like tears would just run <laughs> from my eyes because I have a background in nursing. I went to a vocational high school. So I did like nursing while I did my high school diploma. So I've been in hospitals. I've been in clinical settings and that's just not my comfort place. Yeah. <laughs> you don't go hanging out <laughs> at the hospital. So just the thought of giving birth in a hospital, it would put me in tears. I would just stare at the ceiling crying. Like there has to be another way. There has to be another way. I tried to contact everyone I could through Facebook groups and midwives that were, you know, around and they were like, yeah, the home birthing is not really allowed. And In what country are we referring to? Oman. Okay. Cause this is the one you're going to move to, to theoretically birth. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And you move there at the Ooh, end, stressful. At, I know the beginning of my last trimester moving there. And yeah, everyone, everything that I read online was like, yeah, you can't birth at home. I contacted one midwife and she was like, well, some people have accidentally birthed at home. Of course. Or, yeah, of course. And, or had someone present who wasn't officially working as a, you know, medical, they were a doula, you know, standing in. But there was really no one there to really affirm me and be like, yeah, you can do this. You know, you have this, I don't know, this idea that you don't know if you're going to be one of those kind of birthers, those lucky birthers where everything goes smooth as if it's a stroke of luck, you know, or if everything is going to be okay, or are you going to have some kind of complication? And there was, wasn't really anyone to really walk with me in that path and, um, and really affirm that, you know, birth is birth. You can birth at home. I'll be there for you. My only strategy was, Stay out of the hospital as long as possible, <laughs> try to get there at the very end, and try to advocate. Again, going into the hospital with all this work to do of advocate, leave me alone. So intense. Yeah. So it was arriving at the hospital, some drama about which hospital I was supposed to be at because I wasn't a national, I was an expat. And when they finally admitted me, you know, just this typical, they checked to see how far along I was. And I just kept buying time. Just give me time. Just give me time. They were like, can we give you something for the pain? I don't want anything for pain. Can we, you know, uh, strip your membrane can we do this and I just like just give me time so I walk the halls of course I'm taking a lot of time and they said okay well we need to check you at this point like we've given you as much time as we can we need to check you and at that point my waters ruptured which I think they did against my consent or without my consent and then from there, everything picked up and they told me, well, your daughter is in distress. Her heart rate is dropping too much with every contraction and it's coming back up so slowly that we don't want to watch this happen. You're only at five centimeters. 
each centimeter should take about an hour. We can't watch this deceleration happening. Every contraction could have a couple of hours. So, you know, that whole story. So I'm like, okay, if you're going to do it, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> like I'm laying on this bed. You're telling me I can't move. All of the sensations are concentrated. And then now I'm getting nauseous. And so I signed the consent for a C-section. I was given it. I was given a catheter, IV, all of that. I get to the operating room. They were rushing me so much. They didn't even prep my husband to go in with me. And when I got there, they said, let's check you once more. And I was fully dilated. And they said, okay, you can have a vaginal birth, but we're going to use a vacuum to help get the baby out quickly. And so in that like scenario. A manufactured, <laughs> cur like a totally curated drama. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, so painful. Yeah, so I'm there in my, in, I'm like, okay, I don't, I'm not having a C-section. So that's some relief, even though wow. like getting cut is certainly not anything I would volunteer for. So I'm like, okay, this is my moment. I've been doing all this pregnancy yoga. I'm going to do all my breathing. And I'm there taking these deep breaths and breathing baby down. They're like, no, grab your knees, grit oh, your yeah. teeth, bear down, classical purple pushing. And then my daughter was born, of course, no distress at all perfect APGAR scores. So at the end of that experience, you know, they took my daughter from me to, they showed her to me, did some stuff. And I'm like, what are you doing? I didn't have my glasses on. And they were like, oh, we want to give her this. I'm like, don't give her anything. And then the doctor said, you know, you read too much. <laughs> so that's how I left my first birth. You read too much. Wow. Yeah. We don't want those smart, opinionated women oh. in here. Yeah, you read too much. So they said that, what did they say happened? They said that I had some trailing membranes or something like this. So they observed me for a while. Yeah, I just was there figuring out, okay, how, what do I do now with this newborn? They didn't have any private rooms. They only had like a ward available. So my husband couldn't stay overnight uh. with me. So you're trying to figure out, am I even making milk? Am I breast, you know, like what's going on? They're squeezing my nipples like, yeah, you see, there's milk. Just do whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what I was doing. One of the stitches came out after they stitched me. That was really painful because they kept checking that. Um, they had packed, I think they packed my uterus with gauze post-op, like right after birth. So it was just discomfort. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, this. what do you mean post-op? You didn't have the C-section. No, well, after the birth, after I left, left the operating room, they had put okay. gauze. because They, they put gauze had... internally through your vagina. Yes. That's weird. Yeah. I don't know if it was, huh. if it was, I guess that they were trying to stop bleeding. I'm not sure what was happening. I mean, all of it's weird, right? Yeah. Mm. So finally, when I got home, that's when I finally was able to, like, my milk came in and I was able to start the recovery process, even though I still didn't know, like, what do I, how do I heal these stitches? Like, what do I, what am I doing? This tightness. How to be I clear for that? listeners, the stitches were because they gave you an episiotomy. Yes. Mm -hmm. They cut your perineum and then suctioned the baby out and then sewed you back up. Yeah. Yep. So, so that postpartum recovery was hard. And I think a, part of it was the circumstances, but part of it was just not knowing what to expect. I thought, you know, I'm educated. I'm smart. I can do this. And it was no, con I had no consideration for the fact like this birth is still birth and birth still takes time for recovery and we're deserving of care and pampering. And so other people would volunteer to like take care of me. My husband was teaching and his students were like, who's gonna take care of your wife after she gives birth? And he's like, I am. And they would say, poor girl, like Christina, like poor thing. How could a husband be the only one to care for her? And they would say, my mom said she'll take care of your wife. She can stay with us for the 40 day postpartum because they still honored the 40 day oh. period after birth. Isn't so that bizarre? A country that like everywhere brutalizes women during birth but then has maintained an honor of what's needed afterwards yes that's so fucked up yeah I, well I guess in this part of the world like you know development just happened so quickly like oil was discovered the country just developed so quickly so there's just like a generational gap between women who totally. birth at home and now you're telling us we need to be in these hospitals and it's better and safer and then you still have women who are like desert dwellers who are like I'm not going anywhere I'm going to birth the way we have been birthed and so 
Um, so it's interesting how, um, yeah, these mothers, they were really sincerely like, let me take care of you. And I was so arrogant, like, oh, I don't need anyone to take care of me. I got this, you know? You're so and American. So American. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought, we'll figure it out. You know, my husband will be able to, we'll, we'll, we'll wing it. We'll figure it out. We always do. And um, yeah, it was really challenging. Very, very challenging. Uh, my mom did fly over and spend like 10 days with us. And that was really helpful in the beginning but yeah no clue of what I was getting into no one I was so focused on the birth and just totally dropped the postpartum and second pregnancy I was in another country <laughs> so my daughter was about four going on four when I had oh, a, yeah so good, good amount of time same thing um I did have two losses in between I was I don't know. You, you, you obviously we don't know, but you said you know because I have a negative blood type that there could be some incompatibility. My partner's blood type is positive and mine is negative, so the whole rogam you need to take rogam so that you don't have this interaction. But I'm like, okay, but I still lost pregnancy. Like, is that real? <laughs> Again, okay. yeah, that's yeah. a lot of nonsense. But you know, we don't like they they said a bunch of nonsense to you in the first pregnancy. Yeah. You no. Know? Like, when does the shedding of the system kind of start? Like, not yet? Mm -hmm. or? I would say, but so with that postpartum, there was the initial, the initial weeks and months was very disorienting. I remember even visiting the general practitioner that I saw throughout my pregnancy, and she was like, they didn't stitch you well. Maybe once you're, once you're healed, you might need to see a plastic surgeon. And I was like, what did they do to my vagina? Like, it was so... You know, like, what does that even mean that they didn't stitch me well? You know, just the idea of it was really very just bizarre and and very frightening. Like, and, and is something permanently going to be wrong with my body? But I think when I reached the six month mark, I really came back into my body and and felt my body as my own and recovered and just watched how vaginas recover. Like, vaginas do amazing things and. I think once I reached the six month mark and I really dropped into like this new motherhood identity, I started to look at my body in a whole different way. Like, wow, this is a woman's body now. Like this is a mother's body with like milky boobs and stretch marks. And, you know, like, so I think around the six month mark, I really felt embodied in the role that I was in. And my daughter was really the easiest, <laughs> you know, first, you know, like, the easiest baby, um, you know, she was really easy to get along with and slept well and nursed well and rarely if ever got sick. It just made the transition and that rifle passage a lot easier knowing that there weren't other challenges yeah. with, that I had to deal with. I just had to do my own processing of getting into my motherhood and embracing that. So um, yeah, I, I loved everything about mothering in that that early year I, I just think it took me about six months to feel like okay I, I feel like myself again and so when my daughter got closer to three I was you know we started talking about wanting another child we found out we were expecting and it was time for our annual visit to the U.S. so we were flying back to the U.S. and a week after I landed in New York I noticed some spotting some bleeding some cramping and I started to research it on my own. I reached out to a midwife friend just to kind of get some, prepare myself or kind of orient myself to what was happening. But as the cramping increased, I did go to an, an ER. I went to the emergency room. And as I waited to be seen, you know, I went to the bathroom and, you know, that's when my pregnancy released. And um, they examined me after that to confirm that they did see some remaining tissue. And it was an auto flush toilet. So it was so irreverent, <laughs> so irreverent. Like I go to the bathroom and I'm thinking that, okay, this is the Aww. end of my pregnancy. And it's like, <laughs> oh, that's so intense. There was no time to even like confirm yeah. anything that was happening. And Whoa. it took a while. I wanted a female uh, doctor to examine me. And there were mostly male residents on that day. So I waited even longer for a female to be able to tend to me. And then by the time she got to me, she said, yeah, I see a little bit of tissue remaining. It seems like you've had a miscarriage. But they didn't do a DNC, which I'm really glad I didn't even that they didn't even bring it up. I think they told me come back after I, they might have given me 
uh, you know, some kind of abortive patient to really release everything possibly. I know I had to take something and then come back and then they did a, a follow-up sonogram. So I never needed to do a DNC. So we just kind of sat with that loss and just still in gratitude that we have a child, you know, and um, easier that that was the first pregnancy, you know, that we were able to experience that. So it wasn't, it didn't feel like, what if we can't have children because we already had one? Right. So, um, but it almost made me so confident that the next pregnancy is certainly going to go to term, you know, first time around did. So a second pregnancy, so I did have a, a so that would be the third pregnancy now. And as soon as I found out that pregnancy started to release like within 30 minutes. So that oh. was, really, yeah, like I finally, I had taken, a, I had suspected I was, something was going on and my period got more regular after that first birth. So I missed the period and then took a pregnancy test and like 30 minutes later, I felt the release was happening again. So it, there wasn't even time to like process like, oh, okay, that's weird you know what, what just happened there before I knew I was carrying my second or before I got into my fourth pregnancy now um we were getting ready to move again we were moving to Morocco and I said look you know I probably should talk to someone about this fertility stuff like maybe I need to see a specialist I don't know what's going on um, having back-to-back -back losses seems a bit off but we're moving again and I'll deal with it later. Like we're just going there for a year. He had like a year, my husband had a year program to do. So we'll just do the year and then we'll deal with fertility. And so when I realized like my my period's not here, I'm expecting my period to come. And I was like, this feels like deja vu. Like there's French bread again, like North African spices, like what's going on? So next to the supermarket, I saw a gynecologist. So I said, let me just go in, pop in and see what's going on and she did an ultrasound and she's like yeah you're pregnant and you know she heard a heartbeat and that was surprising because the, the loss before that was only like a few months prior so weren't expecting that but also just really like holding and cherishing it she, she asked me to take progesterone supplements through the first trimester and we just kept it to ourselves and waited and waited. And, you know, as we got closer to the 13 week mark, we really kind of settled into like, okay, like perhaps this pregnancy will continue. So eventually we shared with our family. I did my prenatal care there in Morocco, but I was like, I am not giving birth overseas again. <laughs> I'm going back to the US. I want, uh, you know, I, in my own words, I said, I want a hippie birth. I want midwives and you know water tub and you know like I want to be out of the hospital setting totally yeah. and of course I you know always wanted to birth at home but we didn't have our own home to birth in and I didn't want to put that on my in-laws so I found a really cozy birthing center not far from them and for me it was what I needed at that time very loving care what um, state now are we in Florida okay yeah, so very, very nice, um, very loving environment, very homey. Yeah, I just really enjoyed being in their care. We corresponded while I was abroad, and then they took me in the last weeks of my pregnancy. And my birth, yeah, was really smooth. I got there maybe 6.30 in the evening. I was there noon for an appointment the day my, my son was born. Um, I was having like contractions on and off. It wasn't really steady. So they recommended I do the rebozo, use the rebozo and kind of shift the baby's position a bit. I did that a couple of times, took a nap. And then when I woke up, labor was on. They checked me. They said I was seven centimeters, asked me if I wanted to get in the tub. As I was stepping into the tub, my water broke. And I just sat there in the tub until the baby came out. I did have a Charlie horse. That was kind of quite annoying. So I was like, contraction, leg cramp. I was like, do you have magnesium? My leg is cramping. Yeah, they just let me sit there and birth. They told me when I was fully dilated and they said I could push, but I just, I already had been reading about hypnobirthing. I already decided in my mind I wasn't going to push anything. So I just sat there in the tub and the baby came out a little after nine. And I was like, wow, I could have done that without them. <laughs> you know, how would this have gone differently if no one was here? <laughs> so yeah, that kind of put the idea in my mind. It's really interesting, right? Because women emerge in one of those two ways. It's either, oh, they didn't do anything. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't need that. Or it's thank God. 
you know, thank God they cut me, saved me, mm-hmm. you know, I really, I really feel like that was helpful or, or needed, right? Yeah. <sighs> so in the first birth, I'm just assuming you don't leave that birth thinking you needed any of that. It was more just circumstantial to the environment. I think as I went through this second pregnancy and as I talked through my first pregnancy and birth, particularly birth with the midwives, they were like, oh, no, that happens. There was a the story about the heart rate. And I asked her, I asked the midwife that I was consulting with, like, what would you have done differently? And she was like, oh, we would have tried different positions. You know, we would have tried different things. You know, if we saw that the baby's heart rate was irregular, it it didn't confirm that all of that stuff in the first birth was actually needed. And I felt safe, like, oh, you actually know something else other than cutting women's bodies open? Like, we actually have tools and skills that we could have explored before you're going to an operating room. So I felt comfort in that. I think that's when I started to realize, like, oh, maybe a lot of that, like, that's when I realized it wasn't necessary. And then you have this birth in the birth center, and they're Dopplering you, they're, you know, fingering you, they're, they're still managing you, but it's way better than, than the violence enacted on your body in the hospital. And do you leave there, like, thinking about those things in the, in the, oh, I could have done this on my own, or what would that be like? Is there any, like, residue of the interventions you did have? Or is it so much better than the first birth? It's just like cloud nine. Cause I feel like women go in all different. Yeah. With that. It's still so much better. And I didn't really feel the invasion of their intervention. The things that they did was just kind of like peripheral to me. I wasn't really, there was never any discomfort or like, it was all very subtle and it didn't disrupt my process or my sense of self or even my sense of agency like there was always asking permission there was consent so I didn't know that there was an option for them to be present and not do those things if that makes sense so well except I would argue then that that wasn't consent because consent implies the total spaciousness to decline but But I hear you you're saying you were genuinely cool with it and so yeah, I, it, if there was a lack of true consent that was out of my lack of information, not the lack of their offering, you know, right. their presence, they felt, it seemed, and I felt really centered by their care and what I understood the options to be. And so, yeah, it, if, if in my consciousness at that time, I thought that, oh, that's not actually necessary, it probably would have been different. But yeah, <laughs> at that time, it was like, oh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. You know, I think that's, I think that's what you need to do. Right. You know, again, it's still the story is still kind of, you're still figuring out what, what are the essentials of birth, like what their role is and, and what their so role is. much better. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, there's, there's that kind of always going on in the birth world. Like what's the, you know, analogy so many women use, like if all you eat is disgusting fast food, then when you eat like you know, oh not goodness, food. seen food. You're like, oh, this is like a lot better. But then there's like the gourmet. There's tears. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's okay, so I love that. So you have a pretty great birth. Yeah. And like, wow, I could have yeah. just done that on my own. Yep. So have you ever heard about free birth or anything like that yet? I had heard of, you know, when it was still called unassisted birth back in the day, <laughs> but, you know, back in the day. but it had, um, I think with the first pregnancy that had crossed my mind, but it still felt like really inaccessible. And maybe for those very experienced, you know, moms, like it, I did, it didn't seem like an accessible option um, for whatever reason. It didn't feel it, in my consciousness. It's, it seemed far out, way out there. Uh, so from there, um, I leave that birth feeling very like, yeah, that was a great experience. Babies just come out your vagina. It's awesome. Like, you know, you don't have to have someone doing all of this stuff, you know, it, it just happened. So I left that birth feeling really good. My recovery was a lot quicker. I felt more 
in my body and present much sooner. And then I at, was in my mother-in-law's home and she was feeding me. And I feel like where I was at in that stage, though, I didn't really know how to care for myself. Like I didn't know about the traditions of like how do you actually nurture and help your body repair and how do you integrate everything that happened. So it was just like, oh, I'm not cooking. I'm not cleaning. Like I have people helping with my other child, my husband's home. Like I'm just able to rest and just focus on the baby, but I didn't know how to care for myself at that stage. I had another pregnancy that was unexpected and that I really struggled with because it was, I would say, unwanted. It was just, yeah, it was at a time where I was getting ready to launch a really big project. And I thought, okay, I'm now going to be in the service of women outside of my family. And I was really pumped and excited. And then I found out the news that I was expecting. And I was like, oh no, like this other baby has to be put on hold for this baby. And I really wrestled with that. And uh, that pregnancy released. And then I felt all kinds of feelings of guilt about the release yeah. and the relief of mm -hmm. it all. I would say there, yeah, there was recovery. Um, there was me working through those feelings. And then there was also a huge shift that was 2020. Mm -hmm. Everything was shifting. And I couldn't do the business, the hands-on business that I wanted to do. So at some point, I had certified in vaginal steaming facilitation. And so we were back in Oman, and I was offering this service to women. And I was with them and steaming with them and holding space for them and just really falling in love with this, like, wow, I want to do this all the time, like be in the service of women as they tend to their wombs and heal. And like I said, I was struggling with that pregnancy and then it releasing and then should I have gotten intervention sooner should I have seen someone I don't know was I careless did I do enough I kind of worked through all of those feelings but then circumstantially I had to pivot I couldn't be with women in that way anymore we were all home everything was virtual and I just really went into I think a deep retreat kind of internal work of really getting clear on um what I want, and how I want to be of service, and how to adjust and shift that, and 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 just accepting what's happening and not being so like it must be this way. I can only serve in this way, and so I had a really, yeah, it was also a really beautiful year for us. It was the first time like our family spent Ramadan or a month of fasting together at home, just us, and it was just a really powerful spiritual time for all of our our family just to be bonded so bonded together there was no one else there were, my kids were bonding on a whole nother level my husband and I were bonding at a whole nother level like the whole world was really shut out to you're us. like I love COVID <laughs> <laughs> I you know like it was really yeah it was an, it was a fascinating and amazing it just was yeah so much growth so much reflection there were a lot of gifts within a lot of gifts. really weird bizarre thing that went down yeah. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of, and a lot of, um, yeah, just, just getting to the core and realizing life doesn't have to be as busy, you know, mm -hmm. parenting doesn't have to be as busy. I kept thinking, oh, my kids, you know, I had, you know, I've been unschooling my kids up until, until that point. So that wasn't an issue. It was just like, oh, they don't need to do all the stuff right. to be happy. They don't need gymnastics and karate and this, <laughs> like they actually just need us to be happy and to feel safe. And, you know, like then my kids got to a place where they were their only friends. And even before that, they were, their age gap was starting to close in and they just genuinely started to enjoy each other's company and they didn't have anyone else to be with. So it was a powerful, yeah, it was just a really, really um, beautiful time in spite of all of the madness outside of what was happening. Our home was a sanctuary for all of us. Like we were really just in the sanctuary. And that year in Ramadan, someone, one of my girlfriends said, you know, I had a dream that you had a baby boy. And I just sat with that and I was like, okay, interesting. And this is what his name was. And she said it was very, very vivid. Yeah, some, at some point after Ramadan had ended, <laughs> I found out like, oh, I am actually pregnant. And I sensed it was coming and I was preparing my husband like look because he was like I have a son I have a daughter we have no home we're like bouncing all over the planet I'm good I don't really feel like we need a large family or need a lot of kids so it wasn't there was no pressure either you know from him at all it was just like I needed to prep him saying that you know 
this could there could be another one on the way and I just want you to be prepared and once I was able to confirm that yeah I was pregnant it was welcome very very welcome news for the whole family and I was in a better place to receive it but I couldn't go anyplace else to give birth <laughs> you know borders were closed I didn't have the option of just going back to the U.S. to birth however I wanted and so early pregnancy it was really sitting that with that like and is it time? Am I finally going to get the home birth I've been wanting for close to 12 years now? Like, and if I'm going to do it, I have to do it rogue and I have to do it on my own terms and I'm not going to get support for it, you know, at least not officially. And so I sat with the idea and I was like, do I succumb? Do I like concede and just get to do the hospital thing? Because there's always the thing hanging over your head is the birth record. If you have no birth record, you get no passport. If you have no passport, you can't travel. So you kind of get the paperwork makes it complicated. And then I thought, okay, maybe I'll work with this one hospital that has water births. And they were like, no, because of COVID, no water births, not allowed. Actually. I don't know. <laughs> like, what does one have to do with the other? I don't know. But like, it's just like, yeah, that's not happening. And so the idea of free birth. I was telling my husband, like, I just want to birth at home. Like, that's really what I want to do. And um, I was like, yeah, you think we could just do it? Just us? And he was like, can you get at least someone else to come with us? Like, I don't know if I can support you alone in that. Like, can you find if there's someone else? I don't mind. Like, we can do it. But can you bring someone else in to be of support? Someone who has birthed <laughs> and can be, like, of support to you. So it crossed my mind and I listened to another free birther who in the region, she shared her story on your podcast. And I think I needed to hear what was on the other side of the what if, like, and what happens. So it's like, okay, you birth at home and then what? Did you get a birth record? Did you get a birth certificate? Yeah. And it was like, yeah, eventually you get it. Because I knew a doula in UAE and UAE is shares a border with Oman. And so I contacted a doula in UAE and I was like, do you know any doulas that would attend a home birth? off the record, like just someone who would come. And yeah. so she started asking around if she knew any midwives that would be willing to be present for a home birth, kind of um, unofficially. And she said, but you know, Adula, I know she just had a free birth and she said it was amazing. You want to talk to her? So she connected us and we talked. Aww. And before I even like clearly said it, she was, William was like, have you considered a free birth? <laughs> and I said, yeah, like I didn't really say it in those terms, but it was in my mind. And um, so we would have conversations and then she said, you know, there's someone else in, in Oman who had a free birth. Let me connect you two. And then right. we had a conversation and she was like, yep, they tried to give me a hard time, but eventually you get your papers and you move on. Mm -hmm. So that helped to demystify the like what yeah. happens after process. Mm -hmm. Of course, I still, you know, to still get a birth record, you still need a bit of a paper trail. So I did get some occasional prenatal tear the the least of it the minimal that I could and when I got to the end of the pregnancy as I was nearing the end of the pregnancy I did find a retired midwife and I told her I would like to give birth at home you know would you be willing to be present and she said if everything seems normal at the end of the pregnancy no complications like your blood sugar your blood pressure everything seems fairly stable I would be willing to be present as long as you go to the hospital afterwards so I said, okay, I can work with that. But yeah, as we, my husband and I continued to prepare ourselves and, you know, really confront what the fears were and how we were really feeling and really come to that place, I realized like, um, I, I'll call her if I need her, but I know I feel safest right here in this home, in this bedroom. So why would I want to birth any place else? And so I think a couple of days prior to the birth, the midwife was kind of on deck if I needed her. The doctor said, I'll see you in the hospital. And I just thought, no, you won't. <laughs> and yeah, so what happened that day, I took my kids to the library and I started feeling some tightening in the morning, some like tightening sensations. And I just was like, okay, I don't want to call my husband in from work. So let me just not do too much activity. We went to the library. We went home, we went through our day, and as the day was getting closer to the end of the workday, things started to pick up. I had a friend nearby who was going to keep my older two kids, because my eldest, she didn't want to, she's like, I, I don't know if I can stand to see you in 
any difficulty, you know, so she didn't want to be present, but she wanted to be there right after the birth. So we dropped them off. We just were home and the, the babies just come out. I don't know. I climbed up. I don't, <laughs> right? know, I don't know where to start. Like this, this whole podcast is going to like disintegrate into women just being like, you know, I just, I stayed home. <laughs> you just, the baby just come out. I mean, I so yeah, it was, it was nighttime. I remember I was doing some steaming, like, you know, beforehand. And I felt really grounded in doing that. Like that felt really supportive. And then at some point I couldn't sit still anymore. Um, we had a pool, but no time to do that. So I climbed up on the bed. I had like a yoga ball on the bed. And I just remember just being there, like, yeah, waiting for the baby to come out. I don't know. It's uh, trying to think what was vivid about that time was just like, I'm just so glad I'm here and I'm not anyplace else because I feel like anyone else would have really tried to sway me into making it end quicker or doing something to you know make it happen faster and it just got to be us home alone and um yeah it was it was beautiful my you know baby's head comes out and what's the same and baby's head comes out and you wait a little bit the rest of the body comes out and you know <laughs> Yeah. I mean, he's, he's alive and well and I think up until that point we had already had all the discussions like what if this happens and then we just answered the what if well then we'll do that or what if that happens well then we'll do that but the fear wasn't there anymore there wasn't like all the fears had been confronted and we had done some artwork and birthing from within exercises together and there was like a real shift when I realized like he fully trusts me <laughs> to do what I believe is best and you know, even the conversation of having a third party, he was like, I, I trust you. Just tell me what you need me to do and I will do it. Yeah, we got to witness that moment together. Um, you know, my son, you know, he, he came out and he was fine. But the, the, the challenge after, which is relatively a challenge, I, I knew I was going to stay home, but at some point I knew that I have to go, if I want to obtain this birth record, I have to face the hospital at some point. Okay. In my mind, I had planned that I was going to stay home after the placenta is released. I'll take some time to like eat and shower and then just oh, quick. face the music. Like, I don't think I, yeah, I, I don't see how staying longer, I probably would have gotten into a little bit more trouble. <laughs> but okay. what happened was the placenta was not releasing right away. Um, so at some point I'm like, okay, we need to cut this cord. I had, I didn't intend to, but I was like, like, I need to move. Like I'm cramping. The placenta is not releasing. It's been over an hour and it's going to be a hard case <laughs> if I'm just hanging out at home. Like, you know, my bleeding was manageable. I didn't have any concerns there, but the placenta wasn't releasing. And with all of the talking, the praying, the squatting, it was just staying put, you know, my son fell asleep on my husband's chest and they were sleeping peacefully and it was very tender but I'm still cramping and this placenta hasn't released and it's another hour passes another hour passes and I know if I go into the hospital they're going to rip my placenta out of my body so it's like mm -hmm. I have to do something I'm like taking herbs I'm doing all these things and the placenta is not releasing and then I had an idea in my mind to um to steam because I know that steam opens spaces and it helps with release. And so I got back on my steaming stool. I steamed. Maybe 15 minutes later, I felt like I needed to move my bowels and the placenta just pops, rolls out. Um, catch it before it falls in the toilet. And then it's like, and this is five hours after the birth. So I have to give this, you know, account of all of this time that I'm hanging out at home, waiting for the placenta to release. And so, um, so I've eaten by then, I've showered, and now it's like, okay, that was amazing. The birth was amazing. I feel relieved. The placenta is out. I feel great. I don't feel any discomfort. Now I have to see what's going to happen. I have to time to face the music. So we go to the hospital, and they're trying to tell me that I need to be admitted for 24 hours before they're giving me, they'll give me a birth record. And I said, no, I just want you to assess me, assess my baby, and I want to go home. And he said, well, it doesn't work like that. We need to observe you. You've given birth outside of the hospital. You cut the cord outside of the hospital. We need to check for sepsis and do all of these things and tests. And it's not, none of it is true. And even that retired midwife told me like, 
I used to work in the system here. You do not need to be admitted to have a birth record. You just need an assessment. They need to assess that you know you actually gave birth and that you're okay. And they said, well, find another hospital then, <laughs> but we're not gonna give a birth record unless you are admitted. And I didn't want to be admitted. So this is the still day one of birth, postpartum, you know, and I'm going to another hospital to see if they'll admit me. No, <laughs> we won't admit you here. Go to another hospital. Yes, 24 hours though. You have to be admitted for 24 hours. So we're trying to figure out how to get around this. Um, finally, at the end of the day, I just accepted like, look, I went home and took a nap, got some food and rested. And I'm like, okay, if I have to do this to get the birth record, this is what I'll do. So I packed my bags, I went to a different hospital and they said, no, go back to the original hospital where you've been getting your care. Oh my God. So, so I'm like, for now I'm going home, I'm going to bed, I'm tired. Um, so now day two postpartum, I have my bags packed and I just resigned. Like, I'm going to let them keep me for 24 hours. Pray that nothing crazy happens, get the birth record and move on. So my husband goes in and lets them know, like, my wife is here, we're here to be admitted. And they're like, no, you refused admission the first time you came. And now you've taken too long. It's been more than 24 hours. So they did not admit me to the hospital. And I was like, okay, now what do I do? I call the doctor and she's like, I told you, you know, like, you have to be careful about this thing. I told you, you have to have the birth record. And what happened? I said, I went yesterday, but, you know, they wanted to admit me. I just wanted the birth record. And she said, I can't help you now. Like, I don't know what to do. So the end of that day, we said, at least let's go to a pediatrician. Like, can someone just document that we're bringing you a live newborn baby <laughs> that came out of my body? Like, can we have some records? So I found a pediatrician, um, he did an assessment of our baby, confirmed that he's okay, everything is fine. And, and he documented that I said I gave birth at home, did not make it to the hospital. So we finally have a record and then we just like, okay, the weekend is here. And how, stressed, sure. how stressed are you? I'm so stressed that I'm dehydrated hmm. and not making enough milk. My baby's getting dehydrated. So that's happening as well. I'm not getting enough rest. I'm not being where I should be, which is in my bed at home. And even the doctor, he said, you know, I see a couple, like some signs of dehydration in your baby. But I think once you're home and you get some rest, I think this has been really stressful for you. He's really compassionate and said that I'm confident that with hydration, um, you know, it'll, it'll come together. So it took a couple of days for my milk to come in and for my son to be like regularly passing urine, but it was a little bit frightening for a while. And again, when you have such distrust in the hospital, you're just like, let me figure it out on my own, you know, before I have any more drama. We went to the Ministry of Health. We went to the, like, it's just a different governance structure. So we went to all these different authorities and they were like, oh, do this, have this person sign that. And just nothing was actually going through. Have your embassy sign a paper. Nothing was happening. Ugh. So in the end, we had to write a letter of complaint about the hospital and the uh, Ministry of Health issued a court order demanding that that, that hospital give me a birth record. So <laughs> At, the, at, so dramatic. At, at three months old, finally got a birth record. Yeah, they were singing a different tune. They were very nice at that point. Yeah, <laughs> oh, right. Of course. You know? of course we'll help now. Exactly. Mm. And um, so finally got the birth record after three months and then could put in the passport application, which took a little, there were global delays on passports. And our, at this time, they were mandating vaccination to get in and out of the country to go in and out of spaces. And it was like, okay, I guess this is where the road ends. Mm. And so it was like, I saw something from the World Health Organization. Less than 2% of Africa is vaccinated. And I was like, well, I guess we're going to Africa. <laughs> I wasn't, I even knew we were going to the US. So we just started researching different places where we knew people, where we made contacts. A non-English speaking country where my husband can still teach English. And, that's okay. how we ended up in Senegal. We got here January of this year. Of this year. Okay. And how are you liking it? So far, so good. Yeah. yeah. Have you met, have you met women? Have you, are you, are you starting your Yoni steaming again? And what's yes. all that like? Yes. We're organizing a retreat for 
like a wound keepers retreat that's mm. small. I'm yeah, I'm definitely in community with with women, and we're doing cool stuff together. And you know, my business is still virtual, so that hasn't changed. And yeah, and I just yeah, my children feel very free here. They can go to places. I mean, the first day they arrive, they're like, they don't have to wear masks. This is the best thing ever, you know, like. The, the the restrictions they couldn't enter places go places do things I remember my daughter crying when she found out like this place that we would go for brunch I'm like well we can't dine in anymore and she was like but I don't want to be vaccinated and she was in tears and it was a we had a beautiful experience living in that country everything else about it was lovely but it was like okay well this is where our relationship starts and it's been beautiful up until now and yeah awesome Wow. Whew. Okay. So if you have another child, <laughs> you are keeping your ass in bed. Yes. <laughs> Promise me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I am <laughs> that disrupted. Even in like oh, that, that was, yeah, that was so, I was so tender. Looks like you had the amazing that. free birth, but then, and I totally get it. Like the, the bureaucracy of and the systemic like yeah needs right because you want a passport and and oh just to play the game oh it's so hard yeah, yeah. okay yeah. but you won't have to do that in Senegal should you no choose? should okay. I choose to yes I'm keeping my mind in bed for as long as possible and yeah I we're not planning for any more children I feel really whole and complete with this journey of mothering and and there was this part of me after the third loss I feel like I feel like there needs to be a lot, at least one more like this balance you know like you know three have gone on ahead of me and I feel like I need three here with me too so yeah they're oh I love I love my little people they're they're lovely they're they're so lovely and they love each other and they're, they're really fun fun bunch <laughs> beautiful thank you so much this was such a pleasure to hear your your wild ride <laughs> thank you thank you for holding the space for us and just you know like this is this is why we need these stories out here because there's going to be a woman in Oman who hears this story comes across it you know and and was you the first time right who was like couldn't find anything mm -hmm. that there wasn't anything you know and so it is, I mean, you know, cause you've experienced it now, like just women telling their stories, the way it's spreading and the permission it gives each other. And it's so cool to see the underground yeah. connection happening. And there's a critical piece here that I listen to your podcast, like every day, um, once that seed of free birth was in my mind, I heard stories every day. And so it gave meaning and color to those what ifs. Like there was a woman whose placenta was in for 12 hours and I'm like, and she's still alive. You know? There was someone who was like leaking fluid for two weeks and she still has a healthy baby. And so just being able to give, like, like to show people what's on, the, what's on the other side is not as scary as people would like for you to believe. And that gave me permission to sit with that placenta and be like, okay, you're not coming out right now, but it is not an emergency. And if I go into the hospital, it will be an emergency. And, yeah, and I refuse terrible. to accept that. So, um, so thank you again for, to you and all of the women who share their stories, because it, it, it programmed my brain to see it as the most normal, natural thing. Why would I leave my bedroom where I feel safe and loved and supported to go into an institution? Right. It's the most likely place for it to go well. I've never heard about using steaming to release a sticky little placenta. So, yeah, it's something that, so I am connected with Steamy Chick and I studied under her. Kelly was on the podcast. I know. And so we, she had actually, since we had this conversation, I dreamt of her having a baby and her placenta wasn't releasing. And in the dream, I'm telling her, you need to steam. Yeah. And so, so now she's created a steaming protocol for practitioners who train with her. So they know how to safely release, uh, you know, to encourage the release of the placenta because you just want to be careful that you don't open any arteries and bring on bleeding, you know, like mm -hmm. steam can open up too much sometimes and people, you know, wounds can lead differently so so yeah since then she's added that to the the course curriculum and, and I'm like if 
people, if, if women know how to attend births and just have that in their tool bag, just in case they need it, it can save a lot of drama. Mm -hmm. So real. Mm -hmm. All right, girlfriend, thank you so much. Thank you. And that's it for today, my sisters. Check out everything we do, including one-on-one -on -one and group coaching. Learn about our private membership, in-person retreats, and more on freebirthsociety.com. Our online courses are on freebirthsocietycourses.com, including our flagship course, The Complete Guide to Free Birth. Don't miss the Radical Birth Keeper School if you're ready to become the authentic midwife that women are searching for. Together we rise and the revolution starts inside each of us. I'll leave you with our Free Birth Society theme song, Wild Woman by Aruba Red. I honor you for the wisdom you held, the ancient traditions of plant medicine and womb magic. I feel the spirit of the ancestors as I place my hands upon my belly. This sacred portal will be honoured. Eons upon light beams of survival withstanding the eradication of our power by design. I will not allow the separation of our young to be forced upon me. My sisters will no longer birth in captivity. The picket line redefined from burning our wild women to paralysing us and drugging our babes. Strapped down in a clinical white bed, drying up the milk from our breasts, keep your needles. My family will never again be doomed to chase those dragons or your poison. We reject your fear. We choose love. Everything with intention. Death, ascension. I will fly and bring her back from the start. Conscious conception.